The NJA came in, they made the trade-off. Okay, you can move our elections for board members, but you're not gonna vote on our budget. Exactly. I'm against it. I would never give up the right to vote on that budget. You have to understand, in New Jersey right now, 77% of the average tax bill goes to the school. Uh, in my town, it's even higher than that. And of that 77%, 75% of that is teacher salaries and benefits. I mean, so what's really going to the kids? Not a whole lot. I mean, this is, this is your only shot to say no. And they want to take that away from us. Uh, Dan, how do you get out that question on the New Jersey changing the school board vote date to November when there's a larger voter pool? Oh, absolutely a very good idea. That's when the election changes. Yeah, I think that's absolutely a very good idea. That's when people go to vote. They should be voting on the school board issues, too. At the so this particular bill also takes away voting on the budget while moving to November, which you like, how do you net that out? It will be up or down. Yeah, I would like that. They should be able to vote on everything in November. It shouldn't be a secret process. Okay, sir, you have a question? Uh, yeah, everybody on the panel, what's your position on the Department of Education? The sooner the better. <laughs> Two. Well, first of all, it was created as a political ploy. Uh, it was something that Jimmy Carter caved in to do because he he figured he needed their help to get uh, you know reelected in, in 1980, which didn't happen anyway. Um, and the fact of the matter is that within the organization of the Department of Education are entrenched former NEA members. So I mean, all they're doing at the Department of Education, except for a few initiatives here or there, is just reinforcing what the NEA wants. So uh, it, to me, it serves no purpose. I think, I think education should come back to the localities, to the parents, to the people who really know what their children need to learn. Yeah, I'm also not a big supporter of the Department of Education Department. What progress has been made? That's the question you need to ask yourselves. And the, the answer is not much. Um, they've come up with the Race to the Top um, initiative, and let's be honest, um, the states, um, I, I think I read here, um, New York and Florida are having serious trouble implementing Race to the Top because of the unions. In Hawaii, teachers rejected the contract, 67%, um, because of the race, one of the Race to the Top tenants is to uh, have the performance-based evaluation. So in the end, the Department of Education really doesn't serve any, anybody or anything other than just an extension of policies that feed their friends. But the interests of children aren't served. I say dismantle. Well, I speak to the issue on the whole. First of all, there's a constitutional issue. There's nowhere in Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution that says anything about education. So uh, if we were to want to have a Department of Education, we would have to retroactively um, pass a constitutional amendment. Uh, the second thing is there's an interesting history about how the feds get involved in education. And of course, it was always the conservatives who wanted to keep local control of schools. And it was always the left in Congress who wanted to uh, get the federal government more involved in schools. And as I alluded to previously, the first major involvement of the federal government in education was under the Sputnik crisis, or perceived crisis, whereby the feds came in and promised to give a lot more money uh, to local schools. And this was during the Eisenhower administration. And Eisenhower reluctantly signed the bill. Two things were supposed to happen. One, there was gonna be much better uh, science and math training. And we all know that, right? And the story that you're told in school, if you are told the story, is all of a sudden schools got a lot of money and they did a lot better. Actually, math and science scores declined post Sputnik. And there's, there's a long steady decline in math scores. The other thing that was supposed to happen is that we were gonna teach foreign languages much better because there are all these countries that were uh, under potential communist influence. So I asked, 
Who are the people you know who went to high school in the 60s, 70s, and 80s who learned to speak fluent Russian? Or learned to speak fluent Vietnamese? Or learned to speak fluent Spanish or anything? They didn't. Language training in American schools is one of the worst in the world. So the, the achievement that was supposed to be the Sputnik education didn't happen. Now, President Carter elevated the Department of Education to, to a federal department with a cabinet head. Reagan ran on the campaign of dismantling the Department of Education. And the paradox, the irony of the whole thing, is that under his, in his first administration, what came out was the Nation at Risk report card. And it highlighted for the first time at a national level how bad public education was. Remember, it had that alluring beginning that said if the foreign nation had done this to us, um, we would consider it an act of war. As it is, we've done it to ourselves. But once education would, had that much of a, of a, of a national, uh, that much national attention on it, there was no way then that you could back off and say, well, the feds aren't going to do anything. And I think, in fact, that the, the Tea Party movement and the mood of the country right now is really the first time in, in, in my lifetime where politics has really been rethinking the Constitution and rethinking what the Tenth Amendment is and rethinking what the, the responsibilities are for state legislatures and local governments. And so I think now is the time to push that, particularly after with what, what's going to happen in 2012. That should be a big agenda item of 2013. And I would further say that it's not just a question of getting the feds out of government, which would help a lot, but it's also local communities being informed once again about what a good education is. Those two things. Oh, did I say that? <laughs> that's not a bad idea either. <laughs> that's, uh, actually, that's good. That's not a bad idea either. Yeah, we should get rid of the Department of uh, Education. My only question is, should that be done before we get rid of... Federal Reserve and a bunch of other organizations, or at the same time. Uh, just, think, just, just as an aside to uh, the, the language question, um, I had the opportunity about two years ago to take a cruise to the northern Baltic, and uh, the stops were in Copenhagen, Stockholm, Gdansk, Estonia, and Tallinn. The most astonishing part of the entire trip, other than the fact that you could literally eat off the streets was that the English spoken by the students was impeccable. It put our own children to shame. I think we have a consensus on the gentleman's question. We don't, I, I remember when education was 31 people in a rented office space in the old HEW department. Uh, NAEP goes back before that. NAEP is a national treasure uh, that should be uh, supported. But you don't need the Department of Education to promote that. sitting here is a pretty good indication of your concern for education. That's my opinion. And number two, uh, the government preventing you from doing what you want with your children and your mind is tyranny.
differences matter. And that's what the educational reform is about, is, is finding the, the best thing to do given the current culture. Well, Bob, one thing we haven't talked about here is, oddly enough, New Jersey has a pretty aggressive uh, stance toward homeschooling. I mean, a few states is pretty good about that. And a recent report came out on homeschooling, and they're just doing so much better than private schools, charter schools, and public schools that people don't want to talk about. If I could say one thing to the gentleman's question, um, for any kind of school reform to work, be it private schools or charter schools, I don't personally think we'll have the we'll have the political clout for vouchers in a while going for them. Whatever that takes, it takes a lot of parental support because the parents are have to be the ones who are dissatisfied with what with what's going on in the school. But it also takes a lot of parental courage because there, there's a good thing about public education for. You know, 150 years in this country, we had some pretty good public education at the right kind of level with a minimal amount of public money going in that direction. And so we have an affinity for that. It goes back to the days of Jefferson. He wanted a solid public education. But now it's, it's almost like a mania. So if you even suggest that you're going to take your kids to a different kind of school than the regular public school, or you even suggest that you're going to keep your kids home and homeschool them, you get, you get these stares and these looks like, oh, you're one of those. Um, and so that's why parental courage is so important because what happens is before a community has a charter school or something like that, there are a lot of worried parents who are, who are saying, you know, my kids aren't getting a very good education, but no one will for, take the first step. And as soon as a few parents come out of, the, out of the darkness, so to speak, and try to start setting up a school, then a whole bunch of other parents join and say, you know, this is what we've been looking for. So I, I think that's a great question, and, and really parental courage is what's going what's to lead this movement.
Yes, it's a very lucrative business. College education now is almost not affordable by most people. Do you remember the Occupy Wall Street fiasco? Sure, everybody does. Uh, as part of our radio show, uh, Billy and I went down, we interviewed some people down there. One of the pressing issues they had is, look, we, we get kind of to go into college. We come out of college with a $200,000 or $150,000 debt. We're not allowed to discharge the debt in bankruptcy like every other citizen can. And they're essentially, they call themselves slaves. Well, it's hard to argue with that. But, Doctor? Um, James Time, uh, I did a policy brief at Centennial Institute called uh, Spend Less, Achieve More. Roseanne asked me to bring some extra copies. And since I believe in choice rather than top down, anyone who makes the choice to ask me for a copy of this before we leave, I, I will provide them. I describe that as the empire of the academy. And what you notice consistently is in every single state, there is a coordinated national campaign, and it's expressed in every state, to push education downward. We've got to have kindergarten, we've got to have preschool for everyone. Don't you know the French start everyone at the age of three? And at the same time, uh, the insanity reached unusual uh, levels in Colorado, where our last governor, plus uh, one, a nice man, uh, had something that is, again, spreading nationally called P20. So it isn't enough that everyone has a high school education. It isn't enough that everyone goes to college. But graduate school may be necessary as well. And that was the panel, and uh, I, I, my name was volunteered to be on it, and all the educrats get up and say, oh no, not him. Um, so it, the standards are debased. I mean, time was when you actually had to demonstrate some capacity to get out of high school. Now we've changed our standards for the high school uh, diploma. They are identical to the standards for parole from prison. Time served and good behavior. And you cannot avoid a diploma. That's exactly what it is. Hang around and be more or less non-disruptive and, and you will get a diploma ready, ready or not. And the other truth that people don't know, 85% of our colleges and universities are de facto open admission. Anybody can get in if you've got uh, the money. And uh, this expansion of the academy costs parents, students, and the government hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And yet people have not seen through uh, this uh, circumstance yet. Just going to go with the push for college. Um, a lot of that also is a result of uh, you know, the academic academics trying to keep each other employed. There were a lot of uh, college small colleges. I uh, grew up uh, during the 60s, during the Vietnam War, when they had the college deferment. They had so many kids trying to go to college, they didn't have room for them. And so, even after that subsided, you had to, you had a lot of professionals like that who still wanted to be employed. So yes, they keep saying, yes, you need a college degree, you need a college degree. Um, but what I just read a recent study where they're saying that actually uh, the two-year degree with a trade skill attached to it seems to be what's going to be selling in the near future. And really, if you think about it, that's what used to happen in high school. So they're, yeah, they're pushing it out of high school, pushing it into the second and I think it's time for us to basically get back to our roots and prepare our kids to come out of high school either to get a job that they're interested in, something they can do, or then go to, or go to college and find themselves. Sell education. We'll take that as a rhetorical question. <laughs> 
Uh, my general sense of mercy to the panel, we've been at this two and a half hours already, uh, please, so please thank our panelists for being here. Okay. 